This is the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, and I'm your host, Ryan Ray. Thank you so much for tuning in to Episode 5, a special edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. It's so good to have you. A little bit of a warning about today's show. I've got a head cold, but I powered through it just to get you guys this content. If you're watching the news every day, there's something about a pipeline going on in, in North Dakota. You might have heard about it. And so today we brought on Rob Port to help us figure out what is going on on the ground up there. And the reason we reached out to Rob is he's a blogger and columnist for the Forum Communications Company. His columns appear in the Fargo Forum, Grand Forks Herald, Jamestown Sun, Dickens Press, Williston Herald, and the Minot Daily News. His radio show airs daily on WDAY AM 970 in Fargo, and his blog, SayAnythingBlog.com, is the state's most popular and influential political website. So, we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about the Dakota Access Pipeline and find out what is going on, what's happened, and how did we get to this point, and what's going to happen as President Obama leaves office and with the Trump administration coming in, how will that change anything? Before we get into the interview with Rob, I want to make one thing clear that I asked him a few questions here, and I just play the devil's advocate role. And Rob and I prearranged this, and so he knew that I was going to kind of ask the opposite or kind of almost, hey, why don't you say this opinion? So I'm not necessarily attacking ETC. I'm just trying to give a, a well-rounded perspective on this because we want to find out the facts on the show, and that's what it's about. We want to know what's going on, and we hope to get on someone from Standing Rock in the future and to get their perspective as well. It's very interesting to hear Rob's perspective about what's been going on, and I think you will find that there there's a lot of complication in this issue from the Standing Rock side, as, as they, as Rob will point out, have maybe a legitimate claim to some of their some of their land rights that have been taken away from them by the federal government. So there's a lot I will link to in the show notes that Rob talks about. I will link to all that, so check that out as well. And without further ado, here's my interview with Rob. Well, Rob, thank you so much for being on with us today. I know you're very busy and you've got a lot going on, so thank you for the few minutes that you've given our audience, and it's good to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. So let's get into it. The Dakota Access Pipeline, a lot of news going on today in North Dakota. Kind of get the audience up to speed on where we're at with this and the spill that just recently happened. Well, where we're at with the Dakota Access Pipeline is uh, currently the the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, after initially recommending in favor of the easement, uh, turned around and said that they would not be issuing the easement for the pipeline at this time. Uh, They want to go back and review other potential routes for the pipeline, even though alternate routes were considered and rejected earlier in the process uh, for reasons having to do with uh, potential impacts to the high-impact areas along the river, as well as additional uh, water crossings and and the fact that it would be a longer pipeline and it wouldn't be able to be co-located with a pipeline that already crosses, it's a natural gas pipeline, at the current current crossing where it's, it's slated to go across. Now, so that's that's where we're standing now is we're sort of in a holding pattern. Um, as far as the protests go, Standing Rock Chairman David Archibald has asked the protesters to go home, uh, at least non non Sioux protesters to uh, to leave the area. Uh, and it sounded like uh, out of our governor's office today, it sounded like the the big protest camp was down to about 300 people uh, from a peak of about 10,000. Um, so I mean, there were a lot of people here at one point. Most of them have left. Uh, and they're working by, I, I believe, uh, Standing Rock Chairman David Archambault said uh, today that you know they're looking at having that that camp cleared by January 1st. So I think that's good news for a lot of people. Uh, you know, regardless of the po- pipeline, we're we're dealing with you know some some pretty violent, some pretty disruptive protest activity. Uh, it sounds like that's cleared up. Uh, in the meantime, we've had another pipe. We've had a, a pipeline leak, uh, the Belfouche pipeline over in the western part of the state uh, has leaked about 176,000 gallons. I think that's a guess at this point. I'm not sure anybody really knows how much oil has been leaked. Uh, has, has, uh, it's leaked into a creek. It looks like it's contaminated about five miles of that creek. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of the preliminary of, you know, information that's available. It's not real clear what has caused that leak, uh, but that's, that's going on right now. And just real quick for the audience's perspective, how cold is it in North Dakota right now? Yeah, well, it's actually we're we're having a bit of a heat wave. I think it actually got above zero today, <laughs> um, a couple of degrees above zero. Uh, but it's been it's been very cold, bitterly cold, um, double digits below zero, pretty pretty consistently. I think for three four days there, we didn't have a high above zero. Uh, wind chills in the thirties, forty below, so very very bitterly cold. 
Okay, so let's kind of backtrack now. This is a FERC regulated project. Um, and so that means that this has been going on for a long time. This is not something new. It's not something that just popped out. Years, of, yeah. yeah. So kind of walk us back. When did the the tribe start to issue their concerns with the with the route, and how far back does this actually go in the planning process? Yeah. Well, the, the tribe initially, you know, uh, aired their, you know, told the pipeline company at a meeting in September of 2014. I think this is the first recorded instance where the tribe has said. We oppose the pipeline. Uh, representatives of Energy Transfer Partners, that's the company building the pipeline, had scheduled sort of a courtesy meeting with the tribe. Uh, the tribe came out and said, we oppose the pipeline at that meeting. Um, you know, that has sort of been held up as the protesters as an indication that the tribe, you know, was, was against the pipeline early on. Uh, it certainly, you know, they were, but that meeting wasn't part of the regulatory process. Unfortunately for the tribe, you know, during that two-year process that, that you and I were just talking about, uh, there were multiple instances where the tribe could have showed up and, and put their objections into the public record. The tribe did not show up to three public hearings held by North Dakota's Public Service Commission. Uh, they did, they, uh, and as a matter of fact, if you read Federal Judge James Bozberg's, I think, 56-page opinion, um, you know, he outlines multiple opportunities where the tribe could have met with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and there were scheduling problems, or they didn't show up, or they, held, they ended up holding the meeting uh, at a different time. The, the federal judge concluded that the tribe largely did not engage in the process. So, uh, you know, I think it was pretty clear that, that the tribe, you know, always opposed the pipeline. Unfortunately, in the, in the legal process through which a pipeline like Dakota Access gets permitted and, and gets approved, it, it is, you know, they didn't show up for that part of it. Um, interestingly, back in 2012, the tribe actually passed a resolution, and it was something being pushed um, with several tribes by the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is sort of a, a Native American-focused uh, environmental group, passed a resolution opposing pipelines and opposing fracking. Um, so this was, I mean, the tribe had sort of positioned itself to be against pipelines and and shale oil development you know quite some time ago um but unfortunately the the official regulatory process you know they they were pretty hit and miss in terms of engaging in that okay so let me just play devil's advocate here and just kind of take the the opposite stance here and say well did the pipeline company go out of their way to meet with the tribe or was it just kind of a, a dog and pony show and say, Hey, you guys can show up if you want to, but did they actually, did ETC actually go above and beyond in your opinion to accommodate the tribe in this matter? Well, I don't know. I don't know that it's energy transfer partners responsibility to engage with the tribe. There's a regulatory process. As I just said, as a matter of fact, that 2014 meeting was one that was initiated by energy transfer partners. Um, I don't have in front of me what other meetings, you know, may have occurred between the pipeline company and the tribe. But remember, the regulatory process is something handled by the government. That That is the space in which, you know, all parties have, have an opportunity to comment, to raise concerns, to talk about, uh, you know, the, the route and, and things like that. So you have two different levels um, because most of it was handled. You've got to remember most of this pipeline route, the vast majority of it is on private land. So that puts it under the purview of the various state agencies here in North Dakota, that's our public service commission. I, I can't really speak to the other states. North Dakota is the part of this issue that I've been focused on. Uh, here in North Dakota, um, I could tell you that our public service commission specifically invited the tribe through our North Dakota Indian Affairs Commission. That's a cabinet level position with the governor. Uh, the gentleman who fills that office is named Scott Davis. I've spoken with him directly. Scott's actually a member of the Standing Rock tribe, and he told me he invited uh, the tribal government personally to engage in the public service commission's hearings about the pipeline. The tribe did not show up. They did not submit written testimony. I've spoken with public service commissioner, Julie Fedorchek. She told me the tribe didn't even so much as send her an email about the pipeline. Um, so that's pretty problematic. And then you have the U S army Corps of engineers. Um, and, and again, if you read federal judge Bozberg, cause this was, this was one of the, the bones of contentions when standing rock filed their lawsuit against the pipeline. They argued that they weren't sufficiently consulted. Well, Judge Bozberg went through the record uh, and all the times that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, you know, documented their attempts to get in touch with, with various officials with the tribe, whether it's the tribal council, whether it's the, uh, the tribal historical officer, and the number of times that they got blown off, the number of times that they were ignored. 
I think for anybody to say that this was a dog and pony show or that the government just went through the motions of trying to engage the tribe is, is not really adhering to the facts. Also, you've got to remember, just, just for context, the Dakota Access Pipeline route, during while the Public Service Commission was doing its review, it was, it was moved 140 times in North Dakota alone in reaction to various uh, concerns about environmental impacts or impacting areas of cultural or, or historical significance. The route was moved 140 times. Uh, and by the way, during that process, uh, the, the pipeline does actually cross another Indian reservation, the Fort Berthold Reservation, home to the three affiliated tribes, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara. Uh, you know, they were part of that process. So the idea that this pipeline company uh, was willing to move their route 140 times, was willing to engage with this other tribe. By the way, that tribe passed uh, an agreement with the, the pipeline company to cross their land unanimously. Uh, you know, the idea that, that this pipeline company was was willing to go through all of that and then suddenly just steamroll or ignore Standing Rock's objections is a little ridiculous. You know, there, there's a lot of context here that you have to consider before you make a claim like that. Okay, so let me, again, just so the audience knows, we talked about this beforehand. I'm just playing devil's advocate to get the best that we can out of, out of Rob sure. today. Sure, absolutely. Um, so let me just play devil's advocate here again and say, well, could they just move it away from this water reservoir that they're concerned about? Is that is that not possible to do? Well, I think if you look at a map, you see how difficult that that would be. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the, the nature of, of the Bakken oil field itself. The, the Dakota Access Pipeline route starts in Stanley, North Dakota, which is sort of in the upper part of North Dakota, upper western part of the state. The pipeline initially move, runs west, and so it does sort of a loop through the Bakken oil fields, which are both north and south of the Missouri River's route with its various reservoirs through North Dakota. The oil fields are north and south of it. The pipeline starts to the north, does a loop to the west to where it, you know, it, there's there's uh, various on-ramp uh, places so that it can hit uh, a lot of different gathering and, and gather up oil from the pipeline, right? I mean, there's different stations there where the pipeline could be brought, the oil could be brought from the wells to the pipeline. It then proceeds southeast uh, where it has to, it actually crosses the Missouri River twice. It crosses 14 miles upstream from Williston, which is sort of in, you know, one of the epicenters of, of the Bakken oil uh, fields, uh, crosses 14 miles upriver from their water supply, and then proceeds southeast to where it crosses just north of the Standing Rock Reservation a second time. Uh, it's the Missouri River. It's actually the Lake Oahe Reservoir. So you could talk, well, you know, couldn't, couldn't we do it without crossing it? Well, not really. Um, the Missouri River sort of dominates North Dakota's geography. You can't really build a pipeline that serves the North Dakota oil fields without crossing this river at some point. Okay, I want to transition a little bit to the general public. Um, working in the oil and gas industry for a few years now, uh, each each region we go to, whether it's the Haynesville, the Eagle Fork, the Permian, or even we worked in the Balkan, you find that the locals there, they all have a different perspective on oil and gas, and it depends on how long they've been engaged in the oil and gas process. So if you're going to West Texas, they've been drilling out there forever. We went to North Dakota, it didn't seem that the, the population was you know as familiar with the process of you know drilling the well, the gas truck, it, and they try to build a pipeline to uh, mitigate the cost of trucking it. And they go through this process of, of getting all these things done to streamline it so the oil and gas company can make you know the ma- most amount of money as possible. The locals here, are they in favor with the tribe, or do they understand the process and saying, okay, this is what needs to happen, and we want this product to flow? I, I, I think the locals are generally in favor of it. I mean, as with anything, it's, it's not monolithic, and there's a lot of viewpoints and gray areas. But generally, North Dakota's pro-oil, pro-oil development. You know, we're pro-pipeline. Um, particularly because the alternative, I mean, we all know that the oil is going to get drilled and the oil is going to get pumped and everybody's in favor of that. We also know that that oil has got to be driven, got to get to market. So the alternative to the pipelines in North Dakota is rail. Um, We are a deeply agrarian state even today. And as such, we have a lot of rail capacity throughout the state that's historically used for agriculture products, bringing crops and grain and stuff like that to market. When the oil boom came up, you know, North Dakota didn't have that, that, you know, sort of legacy system of infrastructure to handle. You know, we had never produced this much oil before as a state. We've been drilling for oil and pumping oil in North Dakota since like the 1940s. 
we had never had this volume before. So we didn't have the pipeline capacity. So obviously we're pumping the oil, you know, a lot of oil that we didn't have pipeline capacity for, and that was going out on rail. And that created problems because, you know, I'm sure you remember from a few years ago, we had rail derailments and explosions, and there was a lot of concern about the safety there, which is justified. But also another part of that was that the oil was clogging the uh, rail capacity for agriculture, which is another one of North Dakota's very important industries. So I think generally in North Dakota, we want to build pipelines because the pipeline takes the oil off the rails and not only clears up that capacity for our other major industries, manufacturing and agriculture, but also because those rails run through just about every city in our state. And, you know, when you're seeing all those those oil shipments and, and you understand that, you know, derailments happen and explosions happen, I think most people feel the more oil in the pipelines, the better. Okay, so it, it sounds like you're saying there's a, a general consensus or a, a majority, at least, of North Dakotians are, are in favor of pipelines. Where are the protesters coming from then? Mostly it's, mostly it's the reservation community. Um, and mostly from out of state. You know, if you look at the, I, I think the last number I saw for Morton County was somewhere north of 560 uh, people arrested during the course of this, these months of protest, um, over 90% of them from out of state. Um, I, when I talk with, um, you know, e- even when I talk with, with law enforcement officials who have been down on the front line of the protest, you know, what they tell me is a lot of the faces they see engaging in some of the most violent and unlawful protesting are not really Native American faces. You know, they're, they're people from California and Seattle and places like that. I, I think what you have seen is Standing Rock initiated, because they have concerns about the pipeline route, initiated a protest. And then that protest was sort of co-opted by this national network of environmental interests that, you know, I, I think turned it into something that maybe was a lot more than even than even Standing Rock uh, intended. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, Chairman Archambault sure sounded almost sort of regretful about what was happening. I mean, he was talking about the impact that the camps were having on the land and they were bur- burying their garbage and digging holes and building buildings. And he sounded regretful. I, I think if you could catch him in an honest moment, you might find a man who is maybe regretting some of these national people coming in and joining his tribe in, in this protest, because I, I think they've done in a lot of ways more harm than good. Well, what is the history with Standing Rock in um, as far as the, the other surrounding interests in North Dakota? Have they been difficult to deal with in the past, or is this kind of a, a, a new phenomenon from that tribe? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, you know, we could we could probably spend an hour more more than that. We could probably spend a week talking about, you know, the long history between, you know, the indigenous peoples of this region and and you know, the, the people who came later. Um, you know, the settlers from Norway and Germany and and all the other places that came to North Dakota to make their homes. It's a long history. Some of it's very beautiful. Um, some of it is very ugly. Um, you know, Standing Rock generally is, I mean, they're good neighbors. I mean, they're North Dakotans too. They're part of us. I, I think a lot of North Dakotans really work hard to see them as just another community in our state. Um, you know, they have a very beautiful history. They have very strong and deep ties to our land. Um, you know, I, I, I think I think North Dakotans view them as, as somebody, you know, they're part of our history here. You know, we, we love them. They're our neighbors. Um, you know, in terms of being difficult to work with, you know, they have their opinions. You know, they have a long history of not being treated very well by our federal government. Um, you know, one of the arguments with the pipeline fight is they're saying that the land that the pipeline is crossing, even though legally it's privately owned today, they're seeing it's part of their unceded treaty lands from the 1851 and 1868 Fort Laramie treaties. Um, they, you know, if you go back, I mean, that was litigated all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1980s, and the U.S. Supreme Court found that the federal government took their land and ordered the federal government to pay them uh, a settlement worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, the Sioux have never touched the money from that settlement. They continue to say that that land is theirs. Um, you know, there's a lot of complicated litigation around that, but you know, that's their outlook. And, and that is an issue that is much larger than this pipeline. It's central to their argument against the pipeline, but it's much larger than the pipeline. So, um, you know, the, the uncomfortable reality is that these are a people who have been mistreated by our federal government. 
And that is a history that is very difficult to, to talk about. It's very difficult to, to work with going forward. And because here, here's the reality. The tribe says that, you know, it's, it's their land and, and they never gave it up and the federal government took it from them. But on the other side of that coin is the fact that private landowners have owned that. Some of the families who ranch down in that area have been on that land for over 100 years. So what do you do? I mean, do you go back and you take that land from people who have worked it and lived on it for a century and give it back to the Sioux tribe? Do we try to correct past property rights injustices by creating new property rights injustices in 2016? I don't know. It's a very difficult situation. So it's very complex, very fraught. Um, and I, I think everybody is, is trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, when I hear the tribe talk about, you know, the injustice done to them, they're right. There was an injustice done to them. I'm just not sure what we can do to fix it in 2016. So let me kind of recap that to make sure I understand correctly. If, if I understand what you're saying, then is it sounds like ETC put, put together their best, their best effort. The federal government played its role and the tribe is playing its role. And it's just that the tribe's role doesn't necessarily acknowledge the authority of the federal government. And then the protesters by and large are an outside influence that aren't necessarily connected with any of this process. Is that a good assessment? That is a good assessment. Yeah. Um, you know, the tribe is talking about property rights. They're talking about being concerned about, um, you know, historical artifacts or graves or whatever that are along the pipeline route. Although again, you know, this pipeline is following an existing pipeline through that area. I'm not sure those concerns are necessarily, you know, valid, but you know, that's, that's how the tribe sees it. You know, that has been co-opted by groups that just don't want to drill oil and see obstructing pipeline infrastructure as a means to that end. And I, I think maybe that's some of what the tribe is, is regretting these days is, is their cause being co-opted by that cause. Although I should add, I'm certain there's some overlap between, you know, the tribal outlook and, and, um, and the environmentalists. Certainly. Okay. So real quick, um, Obama leaves office here soon and president elect Trump will take over and be president. Will this issue be over at least in the permitting process by the end of January? Well, I, I don't know the end of January because again, you know, president Trump's going to come in. My understanding with talking with um, our Congressman, Kevin Kramer, um, you know, when he says in his discussions with the U S army Corps of engineers, they have said that they're, they have a draft easement ready to go. And that as soon as Trump takes office, it's something that he can, he can approve pretty quickly. So I think I think I think President elect Trump, when he becomes president, in fact, can walk back what Obama has done pretty quickly. Now, the question will be, how will the courts respond to that? Because, you know, and, and that maybe that's a question that's better for a lawyer. But, you know, I'm certain that that the tribe and, and the environmental activists are going to file more lawsuits. They're going to ask the courts to step in. They haven't done a very good job of winning in court so far. I mean, this has been challenged in court twice. It has been upheld by, you know, the, the pipeline and, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The process that they put into this has been upheld by district court judges. It's been held, held by appeals court judges. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that they have legal standing. That said, you don't necessarily have to win the argument to delay something like this for months. So end of January, I don't know. That seems like an awful quick timeline. Um, I would say that there's probably going to be at least a couple months of legal wrangling uh, before this thing gets finished. And, and we never know. I mean, a lot of the protesters have left too. They could come back to North Dakota and start up with their antics again. I think both the pipeline company and law enforcement here are going to be better prepared this time around. But, you know, last time they were able to get in, they were burning excavators and, and, and lighting construction equipment on fire and locking themselves and, and making it very, very difficult for the pipeline workers to do their work. So, you know, the potential for a lot of delays is, is very, very real. It's, it's going to be interesting to watch it play out. Rob, thank you so much for coming on today. You've given us a lot to think about, and you've really shaped a perspective, I think, that is not being told. So let's plug your blog, and where else can we find information about, you know, these land issues that have been going on in North Dakota for hundreds of years now? Just kind of give the people some resources and promote whatever you need to promote as well. Yeah, well, sayanythingblog.com is my blog. I also write uh, columns for Forum News Service. I work for Forum Communications Company. Um, you could find my columns in the Fargo Forum, Grand Forks Herald, Jamestown Sun, 
most of North Dakota's daily newspapers. Uh, I also have a radio show on WDAY out of Fargo and a podcast. You can check that link. I talk about this issue a lot. Um, so I, I would think that I, I'm a pretty good person to follow on it. Uh, in terms of, of a lot of the history of, uh, of you know the Native American people in, in this part of the country, um, you know, I would look at uh, – there's a book called Damned Indians. Uh, it's, it's damned as in the dams along the Missouri River, which is a big – was was probably the most modern relocation of, of the Native American tribes. It's a very, very insightful book. Um, also, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe on their official tribal website has a lot of very good history about the um, about the, the Fort Laramie treaties. Uh, and I would I would reach out. I mean, the, the Native American people, it's a very proud culture. It's a very beautiful culture. Um, you know, and, and they're not they're not necessarily wrong about the way they've been mistreated. I'm just not necessarily sure they're right about how to how to how to rectify those wrongs in 2016 uh, but their website has a lot of very good information i would check that out as well okay great and we look forward to hopefully having you on again once this um the next development or maybe when this is resolved and to to kind of get us up to speed so thank you for coming on and we hope to have you on again in the future yeah anytime thanks again to rob for coming on really good stuff there a lot to digest i just want to kind of recap my thoughts for you the first thing is, it was interesting to note that the violence for the protesters is not coming from the Standing Rock tribe. It's coming from outside influences predominantly. And so Standing Rock is going about this in a way that is saying, hey, we, we feel like we're being infringed upon, but there's also the angle where they didn't handle it as we would think it should be handled, or maybe think it should be handled at least. However, it sounded as if they didn't do that because they really don't recognize the authority of the government in this issue because they believe the land should still be theirs. There's a lot going on. It sounds like energy transfer went through all of the proper channels to make sure that they accommodated the tribe in this process. And now it seems to be tied up in a political thing where the government is saying, even though you did everything right, we're still going to deny you this permit, even though when the president changes here in a few months, it will get passed. And then you'll have, as Rob mentioned, litigation We're going to link to Rob, so go check him out and follow him so you can keep up with what's going on. We're going to link to the book, the Damned Indians book he mentioned, and hopefully we're going to try to do a little research to see if we can find some good links for the treaties that he spoke of. And we also will link to the Standing Rock Tribes website so you can go there and read kind of their perspective of what's going on. Great show. Really enjoyed this. was really insightful. Again, sorry for my voice and all that's going on. I had this little head cold, but I wanted to get this out. Rob had graciously agreed to come on. I think this is something that a lot of people in the energy profession care about and are concerned about and are curious about what's going on. And as we talked about, and we're kind of getting into this discussion now about states' involvement versus the private entities, here we see a, a, a conflict where the, the private entity does what the state requires, and then there's protests, and there's objections, and the state is saying, well, now you can't do it. And so there's all of these different facets, as we go through these shows, we're going to see that it's not as clear-cut as we always like for it to be. There are times where it's a little bit more obvious of who's right and who's wrong. Here it seems like energy transfer has done the right thing according to what they've been told, and they followed their guidelines, and yet there is backlash from two different groups. One from a tribe who, according to Rob at least, was mistreated many, many years ago and to reclaim what they feel is properly theirs. And this environmental group that's saying, hey, we just don't care what's going on. We're going to be against oil anytime we can. A lot of fascinating stuff. Check out the show notes. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We really could use it to help get this podcast and other podcasts out to the general public. Next week, we'll be going down to South Africa and talking to my good friend, Ernest, talking about electricity and what's going on there. So stay tuned for that. And if you want to reach me, globalenergyleaders at gmail.com is the way to do it globalenergyleaders at gmail.com. If you have some insight on this situation or any other podcast that we do, we'd love to hear from you. If we have a mistake or something we should have added, please reach out to me at globalenergyleaders at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in to the Global Energy Leaders podcast. If you could, please rate, subscribe, review wherever you found this podcast. And until next time, keep climbing.